Welcome to the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, The State of the Energy Industry in Europe. Dr. Adriana Ramirez, Chair of the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee, and myself, Lori Whitesell, will serve as your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation followed by an extended question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you'd like to ask questions, Please raise your hand in the webinar interface and I will adjust your settings to allow you to ask your questions directly. Alternatively, you can enter your questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. That said, you may also ask questions as we go along. Today's presentation is by Eric Hansen. He has 15 years experience of recruiting management and senior professionals to the oil and gas sector globally, primarily within the field of geophysics or geoscience. During these years, he has worked as a senior recruiter and director for large recruiting teams focusing on delivering recruitment services to the oil and gas sector in the United Kingdom, Scandinavia, Asia Pacific, and the United States. Without further ado, please welcome Eric Hansen. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good, uh, good evening all, uh, wherever you may be in this world. Um, I'm sat here in Oslo and uh, we have the weather like it's uh, still autumn here, unfortunately. But uh, it's a pleasure being invited to speak to you all today. Uh, really look forward to it. Uh, when I was first asked uh, to hold this webinar, I was somewhat skeptic um i'm speaking to people that have a lot higher education than me uh, i'm speaking to people that often focuses on statistics and and research when they present things and and i'm kind of the only bachelor degree educated one from from manchester in the uk uh, that is just a recruiter uh, but my understanding was that perhaps it would be good to have someone from outside the geophysical community to present. Uh, and once I started looking at it, I, um, uh, I felt sure that I could actually contribute uh, to some extent that you will go away from this with, with having learned something. Um, feel free to ask questions on, as we go along, as, uh, as Laurie said. Um, what I want to do today is talk about the state of the energy, energy industry from a career perspective. Um, that's where I have my background, uh, that's where I'm working now um, and I have quite a few hopefully interesting things to, to share with you today. Uh, my plan for this short webinar is to do a brief bio on myself and my background. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the changes that I've seen post the, the downturn, uh, so what's happened in the last few years. Uh, I'm going to talk about a bit about the big four to become attractive in the market in 2019. What does the market when hiring expect from a geoscientist, geophysicist, geologist? Um, I also want to share a bit of my concern around the skill shortage that uh, will take place in the industry. It perhaps it's not there now, but it will be in 10, 15, 20 years. And then I'm going to share something with you that's quite interesting that I'm pretty certain none of you are aware of or, or heard. Um, as you will see shortly, my background until 2013 was recruiting out of the UK. Uh, and I worked for a great company that took the job very seriously. Uh, but it is often seen as a cowboy industry in terms of how UK people in particular recruit. And there's certain things I think you guys need to be aware of uh, to ensure that both your privacy and your CV is protected. Um, and at the end, I thought there may be someone, uh, I know already someone that's uh, joining this, uh, looking for a job at the moment. I'm going to share a few brief tips on, on uh, that perhaps you can, can take with you. Um, in relation to myself, I'm originally from Norway uh, and working in Norway now. Uh, I left uh, college in uh, southern Norway and moved to Manchester, England to study uh, and I did a bachelor degree in international business. Uh, my plan was to do a master's degree but um, I kind of got to hear about this recruitment industry. Uh, to some extent it was something I never really thought of or even heard of before. Uh, but as I researched it a bit further I decided to 
try it out if you like uh, and take a bit of a break so uh, i worked one year in in exxon mobil on the um uh, downstream side of things and then i finally got a job as a recruiter for a large international company um the first few years i worked as a physical recruiter i recruited both permanent people into oil and gas jobs and also contract people into oil and gas jobs or, or consultants if you like um, during that time we mainly worked towards europe and aberdeen uh, but also did a fair bit in in london and typically it would be senior or principal geoscientists geophysicists exploration managers etc etc um, in terms of companies it's kind of important that i give you background to what type of companies we have worked with as well uh, on the oil company side or operator side we work with shell conical phillips equinor or statoil as it was back then uh, also work with some of the smaller operating companies which was quite interesting so we work with uh, with eon oil and gas with uh, explorer petroleum uh, with premier oil to name a few um, on the other side we also work a lot with the oil and gas service companies uh, and i've been heavily involved in recruiting for tgs uh, pgs in the uk schlumberger in the uk and the us uh, and also done quite a bit of work with with cgg here in norway and and some in paris um, when the oil crisis hit us, hit us uh, I just started my own recruitment company here in Oslo, uh, a recruitment company that was called Oil and Gas Search. And I don't think uh, it was that smart starting a recruitment business to the oil and gas sector in 2014. But, but that's what I did. And, um, you know, it quickly became apparent that this wasn't a business I could run. Uh, while the oil price was so low and, and while the big, big companies and small companies had to let people go. Um, and as a result of that, we make, uh, became quite involved on the outplacement side of things. Uh, what that means here in Norway and perhaps in the rest of Europe is that we uh, were involved when companies had to let go of people. They joined a career program with ourselves uh, with the ultimate aim of getting them out in a new job. Uh, some of the companies we worked with here in Norway were Schlumberger, Western Geco. We did work with, with Maersk, with Explorer Petroleum, uh, with Shell actually, and, and had also people join us privately from the likes of TGS, PGS, and so forth. Um, and when we did these outplacement services from about 2015 to 17, we learned a lot about the market because on a daily basis, we were working closely with people like perhaps some of you guys uh, that have been in you know, high profile positions uh, uh, within the oil and gas industry and suddenly stood there with not really knowing what to do. You know, just going back a few years to 2011, 12 and 13, there was a big, big demand for geoscientists. And then suddenly everyone wants to get rid of the geoscientists. And during that time, I thought we learned quite a lot which I'm going to share some of that I'm going to share with you today um, when uh, when as, as we go along and, and feel free to ask uh, questions as well um, but there is big changes in the industry and I think some of that or perhaps a significant amount of that is due to the downturn we experienced this time uh, my feeling and experience is that this time the downturn particularly here in Norway I know and in the UK uh, it perhaps hasn't been that big downturn for, for quite some time. So in the, in the past, we may not have learned that much about the downturn, but I do hope and I actually think now that we have learned some lessons. But there's other reasons why things are changing. And that's what I want to talk quite a lot about today, because uh, it's also the world and the environment we live in. You know, Many people now don't want to work in the oil and gas industry. Many people now want to work in a greener industry, so in green tech, they want to work with impact tech, they want to work with renewable energy. And that's something the oil and gas industry carefully needs to consider uh, in order to be able to, to still attract the good people. Another trend I'm experiencing here is a lot of these people that joined us from these oil and gas companies they don't want to work in the oil and gas industry anymore. A geologist or a geophysicist can also be used in 
in other industries. And a lot of those people who have left the industry have kind of in a way promised themselves to never come back. So we could risk having lost that experience and competence and skill forever. I've also experienced a lot of expats, whether they have from the UK lived in Norway, uh, from France lived in Norway and vice versa. They've moved back to their respective countries. But they've also promised themselves to never return back as an expat. So just during the last three or four years, up until last year, we have lost, or the industry have lost a hell of a lot of really, really good, skilled, competent people that the oil and gas industry and the geophysical societies will perhaps never get back. Uh, and that's somewhat scary, I think. Um, for me as a recruiter, of course, it makes my job more difficult. But but more in terms of ensuring that companies can still attract the, the high level people they need to attract, that could prove a big problem in the next few years. Um, but when a geophysicist or geoscientist are looking for a job, it's not as easy as it was. One thing oil and gas companies, both on the service side and operator side, learn from this downturn is they need less people now to do the job that perhaps four or five people did before. So you had four or five people doing a certain task or a certain project in Equinor, whereas now they look to have one and two people doing that job. That could be partly for two different, two reasons at least. One is it's about focus on actually having people more working more effectively. The other thing is of, of course, everything to do with um, with, with artificial intelligence, big data, machine learning, and so forth, that we'll see more and more of. So if you're a geophysicist looking for a job, okay, there won't be in the future as many jobs as there have been before. I'm 100% certain about that. Um, there's also more consultancy roles. And that's for several reasons as well. So a lot of companies, particularly last year, were still unsure about whether we had you know, whether the, the, bad, the, the downturn was over or not. So they're quite uncertain as to, can we hire someone permanent? And instead, they hired in consultants. And that's all well and good, but a lot of people out there, perhaps like some of yourself, are looking for permanent work. But then you also had all the people, perhaps a bit, what can I say, the older group of people that took... Uh, voluntary redundancy uh, and, and received really good packages when they left, they decided to set up their own one-man band consultancy. And they also now are offering their services on a consultancy basis. So kind of the competition, if, if I was a geophysicist looking for a permanent job, I wouldn't just be competing with other candidates that are also looking for a permanent job, uh, be competing with all these independent consultants uh, who are kind of seeing out the career working as a consultant. And because companies may not be willing to take the risk of hiring large volumes of permanent people, that means that the consultants would be a big threat to me. Um, so that's another trend we see a lot. And I just spoke to a colleague in colleague from the industry in Paris. And they also see it there in a country where it shouldn't be that easy to, to work on a consultancy basis. And we also got to remember that there are, of course, a lot of jobs out there. You know, you can do a search on rig zone or oil and gas jobs or wherever it may be. And you'll see companies are still recruiting for geophysicists into a permanent position. But the competition is much higher. And I think the last bar one position, the last four or five geo-related positions we recruited for, we've not needed to do any search or any proactive headhunting. We've had a lot or a hell of a lot of good candidates coming through from advertisements. Um, we've decided here in Norway to only advertise locally in Norway, but we've had a lot of interested candidates from outside of Norway and further afield as well. So the competition now to get a job is harder, is higher, it will be harder and higher in the future as well. Now, thankfully, 
the people that we deal with and the people that are looking at, at this webinar now are, do have such a high competence and background and education that there will always be a job. But if you're listening to this and you're not in a job or you had difficulty a year ago getting a job, you know, there's nothing wrong with you or your background. It's simply taking some time for the market to go from the downturn and come into a place where everyone desperately needs good geoscientists again. There is, however, a trend where it's much more focused on hiring local. Uh, the days where people would pay big relocation packages from people to move from, from uh, Argentina to Paris or from Norway to Germany or vice versa, it doesn't happen that much anymore. Uh, one, because companies can secure good people locally. So that's something that I've experienced more and more than when we work with companies that they say, Eric, we want someone local. Whereas if you asked me six years ago, a client would come to us and say, Eric, we don't care where the person lives. We just need someone that's really good for this job. So that's something else to, to bear in mind that I experience more or less on a daily basis when I'm speaking to candidates, to our clients, to potential clients, and being involved in various things in the industry. One thing I was um, concerned about uh, from 2011 to 2014 was the significant increase in salaries uh, due to the fact that people would leave one job and go to another because there was such a short shortage of, of good people. Um, you know, technically you can almost just walk out on your doorstep and there'll be a recruitment company there looking to offer you a new job. Uh, and the salaries just increased and increased. And, and we've had candidates with us on, on our, our placement programs that have been earning two million kroner a year, working for small, small operating companies. And I think, and, and I kind of hope that that's time has gone by, because we've got to learn from it. It's unhealthy to be working in an industry where people are pushing the salaries up simply because it's such a high demand. And I think now companies are less willing to stretch, they're less willing to offer a person a job and kind of pay them to come over to them because they learned and are more focused on cost savings. So I think in the future, the people that leave one job to go to another company, this will be more because of the job itself, not because they are getting 10,000, 20,000 pound on. 10,000, 20,000 US dollar more a year, it'd be more because they want to work for that company. Um, another change, I think, which, which, which I, um, was kind of frustrating for us to recruit a lot for service companies, that was that these service companies would typically pay a geophysicist in 2013 with five years experience here in Norway, they pay them roughly $70,000 a year. But then on the operating side, and particularly smaller operators, they would pay the same type of person 150, 160, 170,000 US dollars. So I think the, the gap in terms of salary between operating companies and service companies need to become less. And I also think it will be now because these operating companies have learned that we're not, we're not gonna buy people. If people want to work here, they can come and work here, and we haven't got that high, high demand for people as we had previously, because less people can do the same jobs as they did four years ago. Um, there are some changes to how you as a geoscientist or geophysicist can be attractive in the market or how you can beat your competition. It could be that you're already in a job, but it could be in a couple of years' time you want to try something new. There's particularly four things that I experience um, more or less with every type of role or position we recruit for. Uh, and perhaps the first two are, are perhaps the most significant. I think any position that I've done the last two years, both here in Norway and outside of Norway, down in Europe, the company recruiting for a geologist or geophysicist have asked for a person that can also be comfortable working out in a customer-facing role. 
not in a sales role as such, but kind of borderline between business development and sales, uh, where they can be out on client meetings, they can pitch in new ideas, they can develop solutions together with the client. So the time where all geophysicists were kind of sat in the corner being quiet during their work, I think is slowly passing by and more and more is expect, expected from a geophysicist. And you don't have to be an outgoing type of people that are comfortable speaking to people to, to get this skill. Very, it takes very little in terms of coaching or self-development to be the person that can go in a job interview and say, I'm really good technical, but also with me, you get someone that's able to be out on client meetings, developing ideas for the clients and pitching to the client. And that's something I would advise anyone working within the field that's highly technical and, and as highly educated as you guys are. I would strongly recommend that you spend some time on not necessarily getting that experience, but getting comfortable with being in a position to, to add a little bit of sales, if you like, to, to the role you do. The second thing I see companies uh, asking more and more of is people that have some knowledge of, or, or sometimes quite a lot of knowledge and experience from data science or computer science. Uh, you know well that that's the areas that are becoming more and more popular. And uh, a lot of geophysicists that are coming out of university now, they can write code, they can, they can make statistical models, etc., etc. So if I was going to do a, a course uh, as a geophysicist, if I was a geophysicist with 20 years experience, of course, I, I would already know the basics of data science. But if I was going to do some, some more education or some more courses, it would absolutely be within one of these two fields. I would perhaps start with data science and then I would also learn some level of coding uh, which is more under the com computer science umbrella. Another kind of unique thing to have and uh, again I know a few of you that are listening today is the, the background where you work both for an oil company and for a service company. I think people who just work for an oil company will not be as attractive to another oil company as someone who also has got some years behind them in the TGSs, PGS, Schlumberger, and so forth. And I'm kind of painting here the, the, the dream candidate in the marketplace, both for an oil company and for a service company. And the last bit, most of you will have published papers, some of you have been speaker at events, some of you have senior roles in different networks and organizations. But these four points here, in addition to your high level education and your competence, are what will make, a, call it a star candidate or a dream candidate in the next few years, based on my opinion, based on my experience and based on what I see and hear more or less every day. So to something a bit inter interesting, um, my company, uh, not so much myself, but my company recruits also to the technology sector outside of oil and gas. We work with a lot of small and medium sized uh, green tech companies, impact tech, ocean tech, fintech, you name it. Um, but these kind of industries could be a big threat to the oil and gas sector. Because the younger generations now are more inclined to go and study something that will make, will make them relevant to get a job in a tech company outside of the oil and gas industry. When I grew up, my uncle, my aunt, uh, another uncle, they were geophysicists. And my dream was to become a geophysicist until it turned out I wasn't good enough in maths and physics. But people would go to Trondheim here in Norway to study and they would get a dream job within the oil and gas sector. If you look now at the people that are 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, who have to decide where they want to go in their career, they want to study computer or data science. Because that's kind of what's in, that's kind of what is hip, if you like. And I try to put a picture of what is kind of a hipster uh, that we call it here in Norway and probably in the country you're in as well. 
And we need to make the oil and gas industry hip again. We need to make it cool. We make, need to make it a place where young people, 15 to 18, wants to work and therefore go on the, take the right education at the right place to be, want to work in the oil and gas sector. And I'm really concerned about this. And I've been writing a few articles in papers here in Norway where I've kind of, you know, challenged the oil companies to start thinking about this now. You know, on a daily basis, my company, when we try and attract people to the oil and gas sector, I'd say, we have some statistics on this actually towards the end of last year, but I'd say about 35% of people will automatically decline to speak to us because they do not want to work in the oil and gas sector. And looking back four or five years ago, everyone wanted to work in the oil and gas sector. It was where it was cool to be, it was where it was paid well, it's where they could have a career. So the future looked quite bleak unless we're trying to make the oil and gas industry more appealing to the younger generations coming through. And some ways of doing it uh, could be in the media. The media needs to be more focused in social media. It needs to be more focused at university, at colleges, at schools. We need to find new ways to attract these people. But the oil and gas industry is active today in media, social media, university, colleges, schools, etc. But we need to approach it in a different way. Remember now we're fighting with fintech, green tech, impact tech companies to developing cool, cool state-of-the-art technology. So when we're fighting with them to secure the best young talent, we need to take a different approach. And that's something I'll be working on um, uh, with oil companies throughout the rest of the year. I'm actually speaking on a conference about this. And, and as, as silly as it may sound, we need to make the oil industry hip and cool. And we need to show also the oil and gas industry can be disruptive. And if we don't do that now and in the next few years, there will be a massive shortage of highly competent, skilled, educated people within the oil and gas industry. So um, I'm just going to check the time here. I wanted to talk to you a bit about the recruitment industry. Um, I've been involved, I've seen how it worked. Uh, I have, due to our involvement on the outplacement side of things, I was daily in contact with a lot of people that were applying for jobs through different recruitment companies. And first of all, I must stress that there are some really good companies out there. Uh, the oil and gas sector is highly dependent on recruitment companies, um, but there are also some cowboys out there. And I wanted to give you a few tips to, to, to take away with you because it's probably things that you've not thought of before and, and really been aware of. And, and uh, before I start, the unethical recruiters will manage to survive because they're pushy, they pro far, they're proactive, and they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing until they get a result. So it's not like saying that, okay, the unethical ones will disappear. They will always be there. And now that the oil industry is becoming attractive again, they are back. They disappeared for four years, and now they are back. And I've written down some things that you need to be very aware of uh, without being too panicky about it. Um, and the first of all is about protecting your CV. Um, that will have changed a bit now with GDPR, etc. But 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 no one near you're not no one near as protected as you'd you'd like to be. Um, and I would say that if a recruitment company they're working in unethical fashion gets hold of your CV. That CV will be sold in, as we call it, to any company they can think of where you will fit in. So let's for argument's sake say it was a recruitment company that recruited into Aberdeen, you're a UK based candidate, Geoscience, they would pick up your CV and without asking you, they would present your CV or present you as a candidate to all oil and gas companies in Aberdeen. And that's not something you want. You don't want your profile, your background to sit with all the oil companies that could come back to your current employer. 
in all honesty, it's actually quite likely it would come back to your employer. So, so make sure that your CV is not registered in every database with every recruitment company out there. Make sure you select a good few. Be clear to them that I'm selecting you guys because you're professional, I've heard a lot of good things about you and I trust you. But please make sure that you speak to me before you send my CV out. So that's protecting your physically CV, the one you either register in the database or you send over by email. But, but in this industry, it's also pretty normal to, to upload your CV to kind of a career portal. So you could, I suppose the biggest one is Rickzone. It could also be oil and gas jobs. Here in Norway, it could be Finn.no. And believe it or not, recruiters will always also go in there, pick up, download CVs and spam them out to the whole of Aberdeen in this instance. They have something called, they call mail shots and they get targeted on doing this. And you can imagine for yourself, your CV being sent in a mail shot out to the whole of the UK or the whole of France. So again, once you upload your CV to the portals, try and make it as anonymous as possible. And then you at least giving yourself the best chances you can, I suppose, to protect your CV being spammed out to the market. Another thing um, is if you do speak to recruitment companies, they are likely to ask you where else have you been interviewing or what other recruitment processes are you in? So let's for argument's sake say you're speaking to recruitment company X, they ask you where else do you have processes going at the moment? And you say, I'm actually in an interview process with Shell and with Conoco. What they will ask, what they will do once they finish with you on the phone or, or in the meeting, they will find a profile similar to yours. They would call Shell, they would call Conoco Phillips, and they will present this other profile to them. So by actually telling them what processes you have ongoing, you're giving yourself more competition because the recruitment companies are presenting other candidates because they know that's where there are opportunities. So never tell informal recruiter where you have processes until you come in towards the end of the process with that particular recruiter. And these are, as you can imagine, these are quite really unethical things to do and no one's aware of it. So make sure you protect as much info as you can without, of course, jeopardizing your chance of getting a job. Additionally, references. In Norway, I actually recommend people putting their reference names on their CV. Uh, but one thing in these days is obviously it's even better to have your references on your LinkedIn profile. But never give out your reference to a recruiter who, before you even started a process with them, ask for your references. The reason why they ask for your references at early stage in the process is so they can get some names that they can call without you knowing. They take the reference, they ask how you behaved, how you delivered, etc. But they turn that into what they call a sales call. So their aim when they call your reference is not to check out whether you did a good or bad job it's to get a way in, a warmer way into that person so that they can sell in their services and book a meeting. So protecting your CV is one thing, make sure you also protect your references. Most of you probably will do that, you don't have your references on your CV. But if any recruiter casually asks you, oh, who did you work for at Conoco? Do not give that information because there's a reason why they're asking it. They're asking it so they can go and sell their services into this person at Conoco and use your name to get away in. It happens all the time. And now that the market's picking up again and more and more recruitment companies coming back to the oil and gas sector, it will be done more and more. Um, a final thing which you know, which you would never believe that the industry do, but they unfortunately do it, is if you're in the commerce far in the process where you're actually negotiating about a salary, uh, 
particularly if, you, if you're going in as a consultant or a contractor, and if the negotiations are with the recruiter. You could experience getting a call, and what we call a fictive or fake call, from another person at that recruitment company, but pretending they're from a totally different company. And their aim with that call is to psychologically get you in a state of mind where you're willing to accept a lower salary or a lesser rate. Another reason for why they would do that call is if they've got an offer for a permanent job for you, for the company, and you're kind of uncertain whether you should accept it or not. They will then again make a fake call to you, pretend they're from a different company, and try and get into your cycle to use psychology, I suppose, to get into your head that you need to accept this job. Um, and that's pretty scary. And if I lived in the UK now, I'm probably the type of person that would, would rule, really put focus on all these things and to clean up the industry. Um, and I really don't want to scare you about this because there's a lot of good recruiters out there in the UK too. But be a bit careful. If someone asks for a name, they ask for a reference, they ask for a company you've been to interview with, please keep that to yourself because it was only damage your chances of getting the job and also your reputation. I've heard stories where people have actually presented a candidate and it's turned out the candidate's already working there. So be careful in those instances. But of course, the recruitment industry have a lot to offer. They can get good jobs, both permanent and contract. And we see more and more that particularly heavy positions like principal geo uh, positions or management positions, it will always be a recruiter that have the responsibility. But perhaps do some re research on them in advance so you can know that that's a recruiter you can trust. I um, wanted to give you a few tips um, towards the end. I'm just going to check the time here, what we've got. Um, uh, in terms of CV, uh, the rules for CV is pretty much the same in the US as it is in Norway, as it is in the UK, as it is in Paris. Um, but try and put a fair bit of info on your CV. If you're a geophysicist with 20 years experience, your CV needs to be four pages. If you only got two years experience, of course, maybe one page or two. But the rule about a CV needs to be two pages exact is no good anymore. Because you need to be able to portray all, this, all the, the, the experience you have. And with 20 years experience, you couldn't possibly do that in, on two pages. So as a general rule of thumb, I'll say the CV needs to be between two pages and five pages all depending on your level of experience and the amount of projects, contracts you've been involved in. But you may also have heard that it's important to tailor the CV to the job you're applying to. And some people think that that includes rewriting the whole CV. But you don't need to. If you have what we call a good professional summary high up on your CV, you know, just under your name and contact details. That could be a professional summary on six, seven, eight lines. And that's what you can tailor to the job you're applying for. That's kind of is your pitch for that particular job. So in the professional summary, you pull out what's important for this job, what competency and experience are they looking for, and you put that in to this kind of professional summary on the top. So that means you can easily tailor your CV to where you apply for. And remember, that's your first chance to get the recruiter to become interested in your background. If they read that and see, wow, this girl, this man, this woman looks very good, they will pay more attention when they read the rest of your CV. No doubt publications or articles that you've written are very, very important, particularly in sort of senior principal or management roles. Make sure you have the links to them um, on your CV. Far too few people do it. If for one reason or another you have a lot of these publications, let's say 10 plus, 
perhaps write a separate document, a one page document with a list of all your publications. But make sure any publications, articles you've written that are recognized in the industry are on your CV is very, very important. And, um, and like I said, if it's too many, make a separate document for it. Um, you can never sum up all your experience on your CV if you've got 30 years experience. So as a general rule of thumb, again, I typically say CV, everything before year 2000, just write one line, who you worked for, what the job title was, and that's really it. You can also put in brackets, more info available upon request. And the reason why this is so important is that your main focus needs to do be on most recent work. So typically, if you've been in a position from 2013 to present, that's the key thing. This is where you write the most info. Then you write a bit less for the position from 2008 to 13, a bit less from the position from 2000 to 2008. And then pre-2000, just one line about each of them jobs. And just while I'm at it in terms of education, any education from bachelor and above you include, anything below that you don't include. So you've got a bachelor, master and a PhD, all of them three should be there. Um, and, but you don't have to put anything else. Um, one thing in job applications, because you guys are, are in such a technical field or technical role, you know, writing about how structured you are and what a willing team player you are and, and how you work under pressure, etc., etc. Far too many people spend too much space in a job application on all these, you know, personal attributes. Your one page or half page applications, I would typically recommend one page, should be purely about your technical competence and experience. So while some people waste space by writing all these personal traits, you should purely focus on the technical competence and experience that you have that's relevant for that job. And I've yet to see an application, I've, I've seen a lot uh, from within your field, I've yet to see an application where the person is purely focused from a technical perspective. So make sure you do, because that makes you stand out in a positive manner. LinkedIn is used, used more and more, and that's how recruiters can find you. You know, in one year time when the market is really hot again, you probably get a call every day from a recruiter. Uh, and I appreciate that can be somewhat irritating. I know software developers in Norway now, they receive about between 10 and 15 calls a week. Um, but, but that's kind of just the nature of it. I think you need to be on LinkedIn. And there's several reasons for that. If you're looking for a job, or if you're in a job, but kind of open to make a move, make sure you have a very detailed LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn does rate your profile, and, um, and, and your ultimate aim, which is very simple, is to get an all-star profile. And what an all-star profile means on LinkedIn is that you will score higher when a recruitment company or a headhunter do a search through their recruitment tool on LinkedIn. Uh, and all you need to do to get an all-star profile is to fill in the fields that include professional summary or summary, your work experience, education, courses, and specific skill sets. Once you completed all them, in addition to have, of course, your contact details and, and your, your picture on there, you will get an all-star profile. So irrespective of whether you're actively seeking a job or you're in a job, make sure you have an all-star profile. And I'll typically say, if you have a CV that you're happy with, use that information also on LinkedIn. Some people write less on the LinkedIn profile than on the CV. But it doesn't kind of make sense. If you've got a CV you're happy with, why not then use it on LinkedIn? Another thing uh, you can do on LinkedIn, which is quite a new tool and it's quite handy, you can let recruiters know that you're interested in a new job uh, without the fear of this coming out to the whole world. 
So let's say you're working for a company, you're not that happy there, but you don't want to, you know, you don't want to go out and market yourself as you want to leave there. There's a button you can click on LinkedIn that will let recruiters know that you kind of in a state of mind where they could headhunt you. Uh, and that's very useful. And I know a lot of people that as soon as they've done that, uh, I actually heard someone in Aberdeen doing it the other day, and as soon as they've done that, a headhunter called with a very unique, unique position. And finally, which I believe a, a lot of people within the geo-related fields are already doing, um, they're very good at becoming active on LinkedIn. And by active, I mean in making comments, pressing like and sharing articles. And the reason why you do that is also could be indirectly, it's a way of you turning up in a recruiter's profile summary. But the more you comment or like or share based on relevant things that happens within your industry, the more relevant stuff will come up in your feed. So you don't have to see all those annoying videos and totally irrelevant things that people post just, just for it to go viral. Because the more you comment like on relevant people and relevant articles, the more interesting your, uh, your home screen or your profile, um, oh, your, your, um, <laughs> your feed, sorry, on LinkedIn will become. And it's quite amazing. Uh, when I worked with our placement and people losing their job and I was involved in writing text for, for job seekers, my whole profile came up with just job seek, seek, seeking things. As soon as we went back to working more with recruitment again, and we started actively commenting on things that happens in the tech sector or technology sector, I have a really good feed again. It's really interesting. But I need to keep it up. So weekly, I need to be in there commenting, liking, share from time to time. You don't have to publish an article yourself, but just by being active regularly, make sure that you get much more interest out of reading your LinkedIn profile. So that was kind of what I wanted to share with you today. I did feel this was kind of difficult. You know, I'm speaking to highly educated people, like I said in the start. Uh, some of you are looking for a job, some of you are not. But it was kind of my personal impression of the industry. And, and perhaps it's good for you guys also sometimes to listen to, to what is more impressions than, than actually facts. Uh, but I do feel I have a good backbone to, to, to share this with you because I experience it, yeah, more or less every day. So um, I don't know, Laurie, if there's any questions or, or, or how you want to move on now. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, I do have a, a question uh, uh, from Andrew Robinson. Uh, when uh, do you see the GNG slash data scientist hybrid becoming the norm? And where will this come from? Uh, meaning uh, the GNG domain first or data scientists bolting into the GNG uh, domain? Mm. Uh, very good question. Um, I think it will become the norm for the people starting university now. And I think it would be more data science incorporated into the GMG. Uh, I think if, um, so I think the courses now, I mean, already the people qualify now from NTNU in Norway, will, within the geo field, will have done a lot of work on, on data science. So I think for the generation as in, you know, the 15, 16, 17 year olds that's going to go to university soon, I think they will experience when they come out with a geo related degree, master's degree or whatever it may be, it will be some data science packed into that. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question. Um, why do people uh, primarily uh, stay with a, with a company? And also, uh, why might they be motivated to move out of an organization? Is there a top few uh, um, indicators? Yeah, I, th I think one thing the oil industry has got to watch a bit is that there will be people working for oil companies or, or service companies. Uh, once they get the opportunity to get out of the energy industry as a whole, they will. Because there's so much interest in happening outside this industry. You know, I'm coming from Norway where it's 
been all about oil and gas, you know, more or less all my life. But things are changing. So one thing companies got to be aware of is how can we keep people here as opposed to risk losing them to something that's more, more in trend with the environment we live in. Uh, but one thing the oil and gas industry, I think, have been good for, particularly the operating companies, they've been very good at keeping hold of their staff. But more needs to be done now to keep hold of their staff. There was an article in the Financial Times equivalent uh, in Norway today, and there was a brief interview with me as well. And the younger generation that are coming through expects a lot more from their employer. They expect that they have a, a better attitude towards the environment. They expect that the employer do more on the, on the charity side of things and so forth and so forth. So I think some companies need to change a lot if they want to retain their staff as well as they have done, you know, pre-2014. Because um, I think what, so to answer the question as well, what motivates people to leave, I think is they can do something that they see more useful for the future we live in, or we're going into. Hmm. All right, thanks. We have another question. What do you think the differences are between recruiting in the G&G uh, and tech or computer science? Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing a bit because when, um, when, you know, when the oil industry was at its high in 2011, 12, 13, you know, we find it, it was impossible to find geoscientists, yeah? Because uh, there was jobs, that, there were so many jobs. At present, it's the same within geoscience. No, within computer science, it's impossible to find people. Um, I think um, I think the recruitment methods are also totally different. Uh, we've hired a girl now that's twenty five years old because we need someone that's a lot younger and cooler than what I am and the other people because that's the way of getting in touch with the computer scientists. Whereas I'm probably much better than her to get hold, to get in touch with the geophysicists. So it's kind of, I feel, I don't know if you heard about the hipster culture, but computer scientists and data scientists are more part of this hipster culture and, and, and the geophysicists are, are kind of a different breed. I know I'm generalizing a bit now, but just to kind of draw the picture. Um, so, so there are significant differences when I'm trying to go out and find a geoscientist as opposed to find a software architect. Hopefully that answered a bit of the question. What do you think different? Yeah, that was my impression anyway. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question. It says, uh, what do you think people value the most from an organization? Equal treatment or individual? individualized treatment equal I'm pretty certain obviously they will change it's a, you know you this got to be generalized but I would pretty much say equal treatment more and more and um, and I learned a lot about that when we we, we were doing the outplacement programs and uh, so I've, I've dealt with both people securing new jobs but also people losing their jobs and I would say more and more so, particularly here in Norway and in the UK, equal treatment, treatment, uh, but that probably a bit different in, in different type of cultures. But if I speak for Norway and the UK, I would every time say equal. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, another question as a yeah. follow up to the differences. Uh, question how do you think we should start attracting young and talented people do we need to maybe uh, support or be influencers bloggers from the petroleum industry yes uh, a very good question and you kind of got a bit of the answer in there Timur. Um, uh, we need to be a bit like i said earlier cool and hip we need to be blogging we need to do podcasts we need to be on youtube we need to make this just as attractive as the you know the technology sector outside of the oil and gas industry, and and because the oil and gas industry perhaps you know it's a it's a somewhat conservative industry, uh, it's difficult to do all these new things, but the industry has to, in order to get the same you know the right amount of people going to study geo related uh, or petroleum related uh, uh, degrees. 
so blogging social media and not just linkedin um podcast podcast is the big one now you know when i search on um, on uh, on spotify uh, and go through podcasts in my feed on spotify all the all the podcasts that comes up are podcasts uh, suggestions to do with with tech uh, particularly green tech and fintech because my company do a lot of work there I don't get any podcasts up about the oil and gas or ge geoscience. So, Eric, uh, uh, sorry, I finished your thought. Yeah, no, no. So, so what I'm saying is that it the change can be quite easy. It's quite easy to implement, but it needs to be done relatively quick. And and you know, use of influencers, bloggers, etc. I'm certain that's something the oil and gas industry need to do uh, to secure good people in the future. I, I want to, to follow up on that. I, I do agree with you. Uh, the industry definitely has an image problem. And partially, I, I would say, as an industry, we have been very reactive rather than proactive at talking mm -hmm. about what we do and how we do things and why we do them and what kind of influence positive influence we can have in, in, in the world. But what you're talking about, which is our way of solving this, would require new people as well. I mean, as you said, we are a very conservative industry. So if we are going to have influencers and bloggers in that way, we actually need to probably recruit them, attract them first. <laughs> so I, I see a, a chicken and the egg problem here. <laughs> what do you think? I'm sorry, I had to say it's, it. it's, it's a very good point. I think perhaps uh, maybe, uh, I mean, I can use the example with us. We, we've hired Hager at 25 years old and, yeah. and we're going to let her run out and find her own ways of attracting the best computer and data scientists. It could be when a company, let's say Equinor or, or Shell, use Shell this time, they recruit a young group of, of, of people coming out of university Perhaps they need to give them the responsibility to make the role and, and, and what they do more modern in a way, make it cooler. But, but it is a difficult task, as you say, but at least the, the oil and gas industry isn't as conservative as the shipping industry. And they started to do it in the shipping industry, so I'm sure oil and gas can as well. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, today, the UK was the first country to declare plans to be carbon neutral by 2050. With this in mind, do you still think there is a career in petroleum geoscience in Northwest Europe? Are there role gaps uh, you think uh, need to be filled? Um, I think first, I think people, I'm not really sure I'm, I'm I mean, uh, I don't want to say anything that, that I don't have a background to, to say. So uh, there, there are skill shortages in, in the, uh, if, you, if we talk about age, there's a massive skill shortage for those between perhaps 35 and 50. Uh, so when I'm looking for a geophysicist, um, you know, it's easy to get in touch or, or find good people that are in the 50s. And it's easy to find people that are under 30 that are looking for a job. But, but the group in between there is no longer there. Um, so, so we need to, at least for the next two decades, we need to keep pushing getting people into university. Because um, uh, if not, there will be a massive shortage. But it is a bit difficult because people are saying, okay, carbon neutral by, by this year. Well, when we say that, that's going to mean that less and less people are inclined to want to work in the industry because it's going to disappear. Uh, but I'm sure there's different solutions to that as well. But, but I think a good geophysicist could also be a good data scientist. Um, you know, this is typically people with a high e IQ and, uh, and perhaps we can look at that as an option. Uh, you know, I've, I know a few startups here that are, are set up, uh, that are working on, on, on new solutions within data science and artificial intelligence. They're all geoscientists. So, that's kind of is the root out of the oil industry when there's no longer any need for people within the oil industry. But I, I couldn't say more than that. I think other people are better answering. Okay. All right. Uh, oh. um, 
I have another, I guess, a comment to the last question uh, from uh, an attendee. The oil and gas industry in the North Sea, for example, was meant to end in the 1980s uh, when I was in school. Uh, we then just found uh, a new field in 2011. The engineers uh, who will decommission uh, the original field have not even been born yet. So um, I think uh, what is meant is that um, even though uh, we seem to have uh, fields that we think will be uh, done producing, uh, there's always a new field to be found or a new efficiency to be found. So um, I think uh, just a point there, it's a very good point. I think what is going to stop the oil and, in, uh, oil and gas industry in our lifetime and also the people being born now it's not that we're going to run out of oil, it's the politics that's going to stop it. <laughs> uh, and particularly here in Norway, because like you said, people said in the 80s that that was it. People said the same in the 90s and we keep discovering new new fields. So I think it's more the, the threat to the oil industry, you know, not being there anymore. It's, it's more the politicians and the focus on, on being carbon neutral. Yes, hello, it's, uh, it's Andrew Robinson here, who uh, so th thanks uh, Frank, and I'll just comment on what I meant by that. So uh, yeah. I'm a geologist, geologist working in, in Equinor and also in, uh, in human resources as well. Um, what we see over this energy transition is that there is a, a need still for oil and gas as, as demand increases. So we just need to have scientists or geoscientists who are more adaptable, more flexible, more creative, more innovative, who can then um, still have a, a long and successful career. The, they are the people who are going to take us through this energy transition, these bright young minds at schools now, at universities now. They have a different take on, um, on sort of the environment to some of the people who are retiring, of course. And yes, there'll be an energy transition, but that's... Um, that's exactly the kinds of people we need to, to, to push this, uh, this industry to the next 20, 30 years. It, yes, it's changing, but we need those guys to help us change it. 100% agree. Very well said. Okay. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, but before Laurie closes the seminar, Eric, I just want to, to thank you for accepting the invitation to present a, a webinar for us for the Europe Regional Advisory Committee of the SEG and for helping us expanding the views on the state of the energy industry. I just want to say that you mentioned that you were an outsider, but I would say that you're more a friend of this industry. So thank well, you. Oh, very good. <laughs> I hope it was useful to some extent. Like I said, I've, uh, I've shared what I could and I think you've had some good questions, all of you. And, and thank you very much for the opportunity, Adriana. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All thank right. you. So, uh, so with that, I think uh, I'll uh, ex extend a thank you to Eric and thank you to all of you for attending um, our webinar series, State of the Energy Industry in Europe. Please look for our social media posts to register for upcoming uh, and interesting uh, webinars. So thank you again, everyone, and thank you for attending, and thank you, Eric. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.